Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone joining. Apologies for the five minute late start. Um, we had a few technical difficulties, which is often the case with these things. So we are uh, very grateful for your patience. So um, I would like to start and welcome you uh, to the launch of Global Rights Compliance's Legal Advisory and Policy Guidance, Do No Harm, Mitigating Human Rights Risks When Interacting with med Medical Institutions and Professionals in Transplantation Medicine. We are delighted to have you with us this evening, so thank you very much for taking the time out of what I know are very busy schedules. The legal advisory uh, that was launched today addresses the international legal responsibilities of medical institutions and transplant associated entities, as well as the professionals that work in these institutions to prevent human rights violations. The stakeholders that the advisory focuses on include, but are not limited to, hospitals, medical schools of universities, professional societies, as well as medical journals. We are delighted that a number of stakeholders from each of those groups are here with us today. And we hope that this event proves useful in explaining more about the legal risks and responsibilities associated with transplantation medicine, transplant practice, research, and all those activities that are otherwise critical to the continuation of this important field of medicine. Today's event will run for an hour and a half and will include a short presentation of the advisory by Wayne Jordash QC, followed by a panel discussion with our esteemed experts. So to kick off, I would like to introduce you to each of the panelists we have with us today. Wayne Jordash is a managing partner at Global Rights Compliance and Queen's Council at the Bar of England and Wales. Wayne has practiced for over 20 years in international humanitarian and criminal law, and his clients have included governments, international organizations, NGOs, multinational companies, and individuals. Over the last decade, Wayne has appeared in many of the international tribunals, including the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, and has extensive experience in advising on international law arising from conflict affected areas and other high risk environments. We are also joined by Martin Elliott, Martin is an Emeritus Professor of Pediatric Cardiothoracic Surgery at University College London, Emeritus Professor of Physic and Fellow at Gresham College London. From 2010 until 2015, he was Medical Director at Great Ormond Street, where he worked as a Pediatric Cardiothoracic Surgeon from 1984 and led the thoracic transplant team there from 2000 to 2010. He has directed research into the pathophysiology of cardiopulmonary bypass, clinical outcomes and databases, and tracheal reconstruction in children, pioneering several surgical techniques. In 2000, he formed and led the National Service for Severe Tracheal Disease in Children, and has held several international visiting professorships and has taught and operated throughout the world. We are further joined by Dr. Jörg Heber, Jörg is the Research Integrity Officer of Lawrence Berkeley National, National Laboratory. Prior to joining Berkeley Lab in December 2020, Jörg was a professional editor for more than 15 years. In 2005, he joined Springer Nature, initially as a manuscript editor at Nature Materials. Jörg was the executive editor of Nature Communications when he joined PLOS One in 2016 and was appointed as PLOS One's editor-in-chief. He later took up the additional role as Plus One's editorial director. Next, we have uh, Dr. Cecile Bensimon. Uh, Cecile is the Director of Ethics and Professional Affairs at the Canadian Medical Association and Chair of the Research Ethics Board at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. She earned her PhD from the Institute of Medical Science and Joint Centre for Bioethics at the University of Toronto. Previously, Cecile was the University of Toronto's Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy and Faculty of Dentistry after returning from a visiting scholarship at Tel Aviv University's Sackler School of Medicine in Humanitarian and Disaster Ethics. Finally, we're also joined by Dr. Julian Sheether. Julian is a Special Advisor in Ethics and Human Rights to the British Medical Association who is co-hosting webinar with us today and an Ethics Advisor to Medicines and Frontier. 
Julian is the BMA's policy lead on resource allocation and NHS change and is a co-author of Medical Ethics Today, the BMA's handbook on medical ethics and medical law. He is also the author of Assessment of Mental Capacity with the Law Society and is a regular contributor to the British Medical Journal and the Journal of Medical Ethics. He sits on the British Medical General's Ethics Committee and the Institute of Medical Ethics and lectures both widely, both nationally and internationally on a range of topics. So welcome to you all. Um, without further ado, and, and conscious of the time already, I would like to pass the floor to uh, Wayne Jordash to give us an overview of the legal advisory and policy guidance that was launched today, Do No Harm. Wayne, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Lara, and thank you to everyone for joining us today for this launch of our legal advisory report and policy guidance, Do No Harm. So over the next 20 minutes, I'll give you a broad overview of the advisory report and the policy guidance. Uh, the links uh, have been posted in the chat. Do download and do have a look um, at the contents. Let me try to sum up though what we've been trying to do and what the advisory and the policy guidance tries to do. Slide four, as, as Lara um, referred, the advisory addresses the international legal responsibilities of medical institutions and transplant associated entities, as well as the professionals that work in these institutions to respect uh, human rights and to prevent human rights violations. The stakeholders that the advisory focuses on include, but are not limited to hospitals, medical schools of universities, professional societies, as well as, as, well as medical journals. In short, anyone who is within the transplant industry, near or far, um, can find much to uh, learn and much to apply from the advisory and the policy uh, guidance. The advisory has been in the making since late last year and has been based on extensive literature review and interviews with experts and those within the industry, uh, medical professionals, including surgeons, anaesthetists and journal editors and so on. So where do we begin? We begin uh, by looking at the human rights risks uh, that um, are within the transplant um, industry. This is the context for the advisory and the context for the policy guidance. And in, in the advisory, we start off by talking about the sliding scale of risk within the transplant industry. From the least severe risk, uh, which really relates to the, the violation of the principle of consent, that is organs which are donated, uh, but lack the voluntariness of consent, which is essential for ethical um, transplantation, followed by the medium risk, which are uh, the sale of organs coerced under economic uh, duress or even organized uh, crime uh, the organized crime of organ trafficking, all the way to the top of the scale, the sharpest risk, the most severe risk, which uh, relates to state sanctioned regimes where organs are forcibly removed from executed prisoners and prisoners of conscience, as in the People's Republic of China. So these are the risks we were considering. And it's important to highlight that globally, um, we have seen over the last few years an increased demand for organs, which far ex exceeds the availability of organs in voluntary donation systems. Because of this global shortage, there are often long waiting lists where patients have to wait for months, if not years, or don't get an organ. This um, is one of the drivers of the black market for organs and is one of the drivers of unethical transplantation um, uh, practices. Transplant tourism, for example, uh, where uh, people pay to travel to other countries for organs and transplantation surgery, often in short time frames, now counts for 10% of the world's transplants. A key, key consequence of this practice is the trafficking of human beings who are coerced into having their organs removed in return for money. 
Statistics indicate this is an, a lucrative industry with an annual revenue ranging between 850 million US dollars to 1.7 billion US dollars. Due to the significant revenue that can be created, well-known transplant tourism routes have been established in, another, in a number of countries, including India, Pakistan, Egypt, and Lebanon. So the minimum for an ethical transplantation process involves two forms of consent, or at least one of these forms of consent. Firstly, explicit consent systems. These are those that require explicit consent during a donor's lifetime or by family members after their death, or two presumed consent systems, which are based on the presumption that the deceased donor consented to the removal of their organs. Accordingly, transplant tourism, which as I say, uh, perhaps um, is the least severe risk, undermines one of these key, one of the key principles of ethical organ donation and transplantation, that is voluntary and informed consent. The World Health Organization is clear that in order for organ donation to be ethical, the donor must quote, act willingly and free of any undue influence or coercion, close quote. Importantly, the World Health Organization does not consider a person to be willing if they are selling their organs for money or other benefits. The reason for this is clear. The average donor and recipient, um, the contrast between the two could not be more st stark. A typical male donor is 29 years old, earning an income of US $480 per year while the typical male recipient is 48 years old and earning around $53,000 per year. This disparity and the financial vulnerability of the donors that it exposes means that donations are very easily made under economic duress where real consent is lacking. Consent of a kind given in these circumstances cannot be considered to be truly voluntary as recognized by the World Health Organization. Circumstances matter, circumstances which lead to coercion and a lack of voluntariness in the consent or in the purported consent. This is at the heart of these um, unethical practices. And all the way then, let's turn to the sharper end of the scale, forced organ harvesting. This is the killing of a person so that their organs may be removed without their free, voluntary and informed consent and transplanted into another person. Since the early 2000s, there have been concerns about such a system of forced organ harvesting in the People's Republic of China. At the beginning of the 2000s, the PRC leapt from a follower to a leader of transplantation technology. Despite there being no voluntary donation system, within four years, the country made impressive developments in the field of transplantation. Organ, transplant, organ transplantation hospital numbers tripling, transplantation surgery expanding from solely kidney transplants to hearts, lungs, and livers. At the same time, transplant tourism and tourists were reported to have access to matched organs within a few weeks or months, while in other countries with well-established donation systems, it took years. The transplants were able to be planned in advance with specific dates on organ availability provided to the recipient of the organ well ahead of time. The, this rapid expansion and the short waiting times in which people could access organs, of course, raised grave concerns on how organs were being obtained. This resulted in allegations of the existence of a state-sanctioned regime of forced organ harvesting of prisoners, including non-death row prisoners. In 2009, the PRC officially stated that two thirds of all organs used in transplantations were removed from death row prisoners asserting rather unconvincingly that prisoners had consented. However, research illustrated that organ sources had to include non-death row prisoners, including 
Falun Gong practitioners. As the execution of death penalty sentences declined since 2000, whilst the transplantation system continued to grow. Crucially, the timeframes also match up with the crackdown on the PRC's government on Falun Gong practitioners. For those who are not familiar with Falun Gong, Falun Gong is a spiritual practice rooted in traditional Buddhist and Daoist teachings and is centered on three core principles of truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance, which guides practitioners in daily life. Prior to the large-scale campaigns commencing in 1999 aimed at eradicating the Falun Gong, including enforced disappearances, extrajudicial killings, and other grave human rights violations, the movement was popular in the PRC, including among state authorities. In 2010, the PRC announced that from 2015, the system of organ procurement from executed prisoners would end and that they would begin to engage in efforts to establish a voluntary organ donation and allocation system in line with WHO ethical standards. However, research has shown that the number of organ transplant surgeries still substantially exceeds the number of registered organ donor numbers. And as made clear by the judgment of the China Tribunal, to which I will turn in a minute, there is no evidence that the significant infrastructure associated with China's transplantation industry has been dismantled. And absent a satisfactory explanation as to the source of readily available organs, logic and common sense dictates that forced organ harvesting continues to this day. Please refer to the advisory report for more discussion on these issues. Turning to slide nine, concerning these barbaric practices, the China Tribunal and its judgment are of critical importance. They constitute the first extensive and independent review and evaluation of a significant body of evidence from experts and facts based witnesses on forced organ harvesting in the PRC. Led by Sir Geoffrey Nice, a well known human rights and international criminal lawyer but also with a panel of esteemed experts uh, in the field of international criminal and human rights law, cardiothoracic surgery, business and international relations, the judgment was damning. It found beyond reasonable doubt that one, Falun Gong practitioners were serving as the principal source of organs for forced harvesting in the PRC, and that the widespread or systematic attack of forced organ harvesting together with other criminal acts constituted crimes against humanity. These findings were subsequently corroborated by eight UN special rapporteurs and four U human right, UN human rights experts in June 2021. They reported that they'd received credible evidence of ethnic minorities and other groups being forcibly subjected to blood tests and organ examinations uh, within China and that these were, quote, credible indicators of forced organ harvesting, close quote. There is more evidence. The Uyghur Tribunal, again, led by uh, Sir Geoffrey Nice, again, uh, uh, found evidence of forcible harvest, for, uh, forcible harvest uh, system within China, this time against Uyghur detainees. And so um, with this type of reporting, the risks are clear. And the risks are widespread and systematic. They inevitably concern, therefore, a wide range of medical professionals who work in the transplant in industry, not just those at the uh, most proximate um, position, the transplant surgeons, anesthetologists, nurses, and so on, but also professionals who might be considered more ancillary, such as the suppliers of medical equipment, fluids, and drugs clinical research institutes, those who engage in professional development programs, medical journals, academic exchanges, and so on and so forth. So these are the risks, and these are the, uh, those who will encounter those risks. And those risks uh, might be, and should be considered to be legal risks. The legal risk of complicity. Complicity is a broad term, but it encompasses a huge uh, range of 
ways in which uh, individuals and organizations can be legally responsible for contributing to human rights violations of this kind. In the advisory report, we focus on aiding and abetting because it's the most commonly known form of complicity. It's routinely used in international criminal law tribunals and it's routinely used at the national level. It means the practical assistance, encouragement or moral support, which has a substantial effect on the perpetration of a crime. It doesn't require that the person or organization intends the crime, more that the individual or the organization intends to contribute to the crime. There's a difference there, as you'll appreciate. This is discussed more in detail in the report. Aiding and abetting is, as I say, one of the modes of responsibility in which an individual or an organization can find themselves in a courtroom at the international level or at the domestic level. And if you're talking about the sharp end of the practices within the transplant industry, you're talking about crimes against humanity. And crimes against humanity fall to be prosecuted under universal jurisdiction principles which means that anyone or any state rather should be prosecuting those crimes regardless of where they were committed. Indeed, if you look globally, there is a growing trend on a domestic level for these types of crimes to be prosecuted and a growing trend on a domestic level for businesses to be prosecuted for their links to such crimes. In the last year alone, representatives of two French companies and one Swedish company, as well as a French company, have been charged by public prosecutors for complicity in international crimes. Charges were brought on the basis of the companies being indifferent to international crimes, despite them being aware of their tacit involvement. Again, I repeat, it's not about the company intending the crimes, it's about the company being aware of the risks and nonetheless going ahead and taking those risks and in the end contributing to those crimes. Of course, uh, in the end, what we're talking about is proximity to crimes, proximity to violations. And in practice, this of course means in terms of the transplant in industry, and this is what we discuss at length in the both the advisory report and the policy guidance, um, there is a, 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 a sliding scale of, of, of risk and involvement. For those who are involved in, for example, publicated, publishing uh, transplant research, the risk will probably be much lower. But for those who are, for example, supplying or distributing medical equipment essential for successful organ removal, for example, to a military hospital, which has been reported to forcibly remove organs, then the risk is clear and present and probably significant. And so finally, how do we deal with those risks? How should the transplant industry protect uh, against those risks? Uh, first of all, to ensure that they don't contribute to them, but also to ensure they don't suffer the reputational damage, which inevitably arises uh, if cases are highlighted or prosecuted against them. We deal with this at, at length in the advisory, but also particularly in the um, policy guidance. A number of steps are essential and mandatory according to international law and can be summed up and found in the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. They place a responsibility on states to protect rights, and they place a responsibility on businesses to respect human rights. And this is not um, simply a declaration, it's about initiating processes. And these processes are outlined in the UN guiding principles. At a minimum, medical institutions must one, establish a human rights policy, two, conduct ongoing human rights due diligence, and three, disengage from relationships where the risk cannot be prevented, mitigated, or remediated. Now, I won't go into 
huge detail on these points, but I'll just make a few points and then I'll turn over to the rest of the panel. A human rights policy is a public statement that has to be adopted by the executive level and senior management of an institution. It can't be palmed off to uh, somebody in the HR department. It has to be adopted and embedded within the organization. It cannot be a paper tiger. It needs to be a live instrument which describes the commitment and ensures that the organization lives up to the commitment. Human rights due diligence. This um, is the core of the responsibility and the means by which uh, an organization within the transplant industry uh, can uh, respect human rights and keep itself uh, from contributing or causing or being linked to human rights violations. It involves identifying human rights risks. It involves uh, then formulating responses to those human rights risks. Uh, tailor-made to the organization, tailor-made to the severity of the risk, and tailor-made to the activities of the organization. Um, and it's not a one-off um, requirement. Uh, it's a requirement to identify uh, and uh, confront and to continue to evaluate the response and evaluate the effectiveness of the uh, due diligence. And so finally, um, as I say, um, there has to be um, a line drawn. If those risks cannot, according to due diligence, be um, remediated, uh, then the organization should be disengaging from those risks and should be disengaging from those relationships. This is not just a commitment um, that is required unto, under UN guiding principles, but is also one which will keep the organization uh, from uh, encountering domestic problems of legal enforcement. Increasingly, countries such as Belgium, France, the UK, United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand have domestic laws which uh, are hard law, civil, res civil responsibilities, criminal law responsibilities, which if an organization within the transplant in industry falls foul of them, then they will find themselves in front of a courtroom being prosecuted or investigated according to those civil and criminal law um, demands. Uh, please, please have a look at uh, the illegal advisory report and we detail what those hard law requirements are. So let me finish here and I can pick up on any issues uh, during the Q&A. But a starting point is that um, those uh, institutions within the transplant industry must take steps. The risks are clear. Uh, the risks need to be further explored and the medical institutions um, and professionals within the transplant industry should be proactive in identifying the risks and dealing with them. Anything less um, is likely to leave the industry and the organization hugely exposed. Thank you, Lara. Many thanks, Wayne, for that insightful overview of the legal advisory and policy guidance. And I think some really important points brought out there about the sliding scale of risk present in transplantation medicine and the fact that it doesn't need to be your direct actions that create culpability, but practical assistance that, um, that understands the involvement, but nonetheless turns a blind eye. What I want to do in a minute is turn to uh, the other panelists that we have here today um, and give them an opportunity to speak for uh, a few minutes on um, their involvement in transplantation medicine um, and uh, their interaction with these human rights risks. Um, in that time, uh, really good if the uh, members of the audience could think about any questions that they have in relation to uh, any of the comments made by our panelists, as well as any comments that were raised um, there by Wayne. So uh, with that, um, Martin, uh, I give you the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Lara. Well, um, my background is as a paediatric cardiothoracic surgeon and I was involved in thoracic organ transplantation from 1988 onwards. And um, I think it's fair to say, first of all, that transplantation has always seemed to me, at least, to be um, one of the highest points of human generosity. People consenting for their organs 
to be used to save the life of someone unknown to you or largely unknown to you or your family. Um, and I was invited in 2016 to put my name forward to become a member of the China Tribunal and was honored to be appointed. And the China Tribunal was a people's tribunal created to assess and pass judgment on evidence of forced organ harvesting in Chinese detention camps. Now, perhaps um, naively, prior to that, uh, receiving and reviewing that evidence, and despite having spent half my working lifetime being actively engaged in transplantation, I was completely unaware that these activities were going on. And we'll be able to discuss that later, perhaps. But when I um, read and heard the evidence, it was shocking to read it, and even more so to hear in person the oral evidence of brave victims of detention and torture. It was shocking to realize that physicians must have been complicit for these actions to have taken place. And it was uh, in many ways more shocking also to hear of the involvement of a state in such activities um, in, in a programmed way against a population of people. And the way in which relevant and necessary clinical and activity data were either withheld as state secrets or obfuscated in such a way that the um, full meaning could not be determined. Um, incidentally, all the evidence that we heard and read is available to you on um, www.chinatribunal.com and later evidence to the Uyghur Tribunal at uyghurtribunal.com. I think the links will appear in chat in the chat. Now, um, good medical practice relies on the sharing of relevant information and on openness and transparency of both clinical results and uh, research data. In most countries, there's an incredibly strong ethical framework which exists, um, and particularly so in transplantation, to govern our activity and to protect the patients. And also simply because there are huge data needs. You have to know an awful lot about the donor and an awful lot about the recipient to make sure that that match is as good as possible. And also to develop an audit trail so that when the organ is transplanted, you can look backwards and see where the organ came from in case any diseases develop. Those ethical frameworks are fundamental and they should be maintained. Now, communication between physicians both within and between countries it is the norm in our business and it has fostered research and led to rapid progress and certainly my field and myself have benefited from both. But those relationships rely on trust, transparency and truth. And sadly, the China Tribunal identified a state and within it individuals involved in practices which were patently unethical, crimes indeed, against humanity. And many organizations in all of the countries which you represent um, have uh, licensing authorities, academic institutions, hospitals and individuals who with good intention strike up relationships with recipro reciprocal structures and people in China, uh, often uh, making money from that. These links are actively encouraged by um, the CCP, Chinese Communist Party policy, vow what they call the United Front Work Department. Such organizations, the tribunal concluded, the China tribunal concluded, must recognize to the extent that our judgment revealed that they were interacting or will be interacting with a criminal state. And it's against this background that I am really pleased that the GRC has defined this uh, outstanding framework of um, a rule-based approach to the interactions which organizations, be the academic, medical, corporate, should uh, undertake in order to do appropriate due diligence and manage their relationships with either the state or the organizations within it. I'll stop there, Laura, and hand back to you. Thank you. Many thanks, Martin, um, for that insight and into uh, the China Tribunal um, and your and your work in the uh, industry. So, um, Julian, can I pass the floor to you? 
You can. I've had some terrible anxieties getting onto this platform, so it is a delight to actually to be connected with you. Um, I'm here representing this evening um, the um, Human Rights, um, Medical Ethics and Human Rights Department of the British uh, Medical Association. And I want to start off uh, just making really a few basic comments um, that I don't think are controversial. And that is, is that to start with, medicine is a morally inflected practice. The focus of medicine, the principal focus of medicine, is to bring benefits to human beings. Um, for much of its history, medicine has not been, it's probably worth saying, particularly potent. Medicine has been said historically, it was um, what the doctor did largely was hold a patient's hands until, um, until sufficient time had passed to see if the patient would recover. But, 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 but in the 19th century, post enlightenment, we saw a tremendous increase in the power, in the potency of medicine it became effective, knowledge of human functioning, knowledge of human ailments, knowledge of human pain systems and human responses became much, much, much more sophisticated. And obviously this led to a surge of hope that, that medicine would bring and continue to bring enormous human benefits. And then something happened in the 20th century. And this is where human rights and medicine came together. And what we saw in the 20th century was the moral inversion of the practice of medicine. We saw totalitarian states co-opt forcibly um, in, in some circumstances, others, uh, in other circumstances without coercion, we saw states co-opt medical practice for the destruction, either, either the direct and deliberate destruction or the indifferent destruction of human beings, of human bodies, leading to profound, profound distress in the medical profession about the uses to which its extraordinary technologies, its extraordinary insights had been pushed. And that was the moment really at, we, at which we saw the development both of the human rights movement in medicine or the human rights or the medical engagement with human rights, but also this increasing concern, this gathering concern about ensuring a protection of the proper moral purposes of medicine. And, and to pracy brutally, right at the heart of that is the issue of informed consent of a respect for the free and deliberative, deliberative choices of patients. That's right at the core of the moral practice of medicine. And when we are looking at forced or coerced organ harvesting, it is clear that we are seeing a fundamental violation of the moral core of medicine. And that is set out in professional codes, global professional codes, the World Medical Association, um, declarations of Helsinki, declarations of Geneva. These are some of the kind of fundamental, these are some of the fundamental codes um, that govern the practice of medicine globally. And what we are seeing, what we have seen in China, the kinds of things that Martin and Wayne have been talking about are a fundamental inversion, a perversion of core uh, professional responsibilities in medicine. The British Medical Association has um, been pressing for years now to raise the profile um, of, of human rights issues in medicine. More recently, in relation to China, we have been pushing at the World Medical Association, raising our concerns on international fora. Fundamentally, and this is partly echoing what Martin has said, it is the fundamental obligation of all serious professional medical associations to engage with this issue, to call this issue out and to take steps at the highest possible level to eradicate this grotesque and inhuman practice. So I'll leave it there. 
Many thanks, Julian, for some really interesting insights there regarding the history of medicine, the ethical nature of the profession, the relevance of human rights, and the role of medical associations when it comes to enforcing those rights. And I think that that will be a point that we can uh, return to in a minute. Next, I will hand the floor to Jörg, who can provide uh, a bit more insight into the ethics of research and the interaction uh, with journals. Jörg, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and um, also rep represent academic journals. Um, academic journals are, if you like, the stewards of, of the scientific uh, literature of um, of the achievements as they, uh, in science and medicine as they get documented. Um, and that obviously is also a responsibility for academic journals. Um, what is very important is that the, the body of the scientific literature of, on which scientific progress or medical pro progress is, process is based um, follows all um, ethics standards, um, is compliant with international laws, um, with international ethics. Um, and in, on this topic, for example, there's standards on, on ethical organ transplants set out by the World Health Organization, by the um, World Medical Association, and also the Transplantation Society. So there are existing standards and ethics, uh, ethics standards around organ transplants um, that have been documented. Um, and, this, and in my view, the academic journals are the stewards of those and, and need to ensure that what they publish um, and what gets out into the community follows those guidelines. Um, and journals have implemented, for example, uh, checks around ethics approval um, in clinical trials and, and, um, um, and, and related topics for, for now decades. Um, and it's also equally important that um, not just the rights of patients, but also in, in terms of organ transplants, the rights of those that are donating organs uh, are considered and, and also are insured. Um, so how I came to this topic was um, in 2019, early 2019, uh, Wendy Rogers and colleagues, they published a study based on also, I think, the work of the China Tribunal, uh, where they um, analyze the scientific literature for organ for studies on organ transplants that took place um, in a period um, in this case in China uh, up to 2016 or so um, and identified studies of concern where potentially um, organs may have been used from from prisoners uh, where consent or appropriate consent would not have been possible. Um, so when I became aware of that as editor-in-chief of PLOS One, we looked into this. Um, so for context, PLOS One is one of the largest journals in the world. At the time, it had published more than 200,000 studies um, in the space of 10 years. Um, so it is a very large journal and then uh, has published across all the disciplines. Um, and we looked into this and we identified about 21 studies uh, of concern that were published around in the time frame um, in, in the country uh, that uh, probably needed to be assessed. Um, so what we what we did is um, the studies were already published, but what it, what we did is we went back to the authors and asked them asked them for documentation about um, ethics approval as well um, in local one as well as documentation about the donors. Um, you know what what were the nature of the donors? Where where did these organs came from? Um, and we heard nothing back or very little um, or argumentation back that everything followed local laws and regulations, which I don't know, may or may not have been the case. Um, so, um, but there was no documentation forward. And given given the concerns and, and the evidence that was presented at places like the China Tribunal, um, we decided to retract those studies. So there were 21 in total that were retracted in um, 2019, over the summer of 2019. So each, each case was looked at individually um, and uh, assessed individually. Um, and yeah, we retracted all of those. Um, and those were also largely those that were identified in the study by Wendy Rogers. Um, 
And yeah, and, and from my perspective, um, that is a necessary, necessary step for an academic journal to take. Um, there's another journal, Transplantation, who also took immediate and very fast steps. Um, but to my estimate, uh, maybe only about 10% of the studies that were, or less than 10% that were identified by, by, by that independent um, study were actually retracted. Um, some uh, have seen an expression of concern, which is basically an editor saying, well, there seem to be some concerns around that study. And, and um, so, and, and the editor is concerned about this. Um, but largely, we have seen not too much action on those. Um, and my, my call for the uh, for academic journals would be, um, you know, that these concerns need to be taken seriously, um, that studies that violate international ethics standards, even if they may be in accordance with potential local laws, um, you know, need to be need to be considered and and um, assessed whether they should really be part of the scientific literature and 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 the body of body of academic achievements on which we build our pro own progress. Um, so that is a perspective uh, where I'm, I came from. Or I'm coming from uh, from the academic journals, and I think academic journals have an important role. Journals are used for career progression. Publishing in a journal can be very prestigious. It's used for career progression. And journals need to make sure that ethics are maintained and, and that they are not supporting violations of international ethics standards. And that's just not, and this may not necessarily only be in an area trans, of transplantation, as someone mentioned in the Q&As. Uh, there may be other subject areas where there may be similar concerns. I would agree with that. Thank you. Many thanks, Jörg, for sharing those important views and making that call to action for medical journals and academic journals and editors um, to take more action, especially interesting um, your views on seeing editors as stewards of ethics and your experience with journal articles that have come across these issues and, and been suspected not to be in compliance with ethical guidelines. Thank you very much for that. Finally, I will give you the floor, uh, Cecile. Um, so perhaps you can speak a bit more about your role in the work of the CMA. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for my co-panelists who have uh, really set the stage well. And I won't repeat uh, anything that you, you uh, have said. Uh, I, I can uh, uh, tell you that uh, I completely agree from uh, the perspective of the Canadian Medical Association I, I do want to uh, uh, preface my comments by saying that uh, I happen to live five minutes from Parliament Hill uh, in, in Ottawa, Canada, and I often see uh, protesters uh, who are in fact protesting on this issue. I personally uh, and professionally did not appreciate uh, the depth of uh, this uh, problem until I read uh, the China Tribunal. Uh, judgment, um, and uh, I want to congratulate you for, for the, the, the impact that this has had. So I do have a few, uh, really just a few slides, just because uh, it's good to have visuals. Um, and uh, really, I'm, I'm going to spend uh, just a few minutes here um, to, uh, to uh, review what has been done in Canada and what uh, the uh, CMA has done. As you can see here from the Senate of Canada, uh, an article titled Canada Must Not Be Complicit in Predatory Trafficking Industry, uh, written by Senator uh, Atulahan, uh, who uh, actually has championed the legislation in Canada. Uh, so there is currently legislation be considered. There have been three bills, uh, three iterations, I should say, three iterations of the bill. Uh, and each time that the bill was introduced, uh, it was by the same sponsor, uh, by, by Senator uh, Atolahan. Uh, it first began as Bill S-240. It was nearly passed in both the Senate and the House of Commons, but the Prime Minister at the time prorogued Parliament and the bill died in 2020. In the following parliamentary session, uh, the bill was reintroduced in the Senate as Bill 204, and at the time, uh, uh, the senator said, uh, for the third time now, I've introduced a bill to make it illegal for Canadians to purchase organs without informed consent. 
Uh, Bill S204, the new iteration, is an attempt to put an end to transplant tourism, the effects of which have largely escaped public notice. And she continues at the time, this is uh, in the second iteration of the bill, uh, she says, my bill does not prevent Canadians from traveling abroad to receive an organ transplant through legitimate and legal means. I can appreciate the hardship Canadians uh, face spending months or even years on organ donation waiting lists. So she does acknowledge uh, the um, uh, breadth of the problem. Uh, the bill, the second iteration of the bill, passed in the Senate, but did not make it past the second reading in the House of Commons because an election was called in August 2021, and the bill died on the order paper. So following this, leading up to where we are today, following the election uh, in Canada, which was uh, uh, last October 2021, the bill was reintroduced, uh, this time as Bill S223, and it has passed in the Senate and is currently awaiting second reading in the House of Commons. Uh, as you can see, the bill is titled uh, An Act to Amend the Criminal Code and the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. So as the legal advisory uh, says, to which uh, Wayne spoke, uh, the amendment to the criminal code seeks to introduce a new section, uh, which would make it an offense for patients uh, to travel for organs, uh, that is for transplant tourism, and for physicians to obtain uh, uh, and transplant an organ uh, removed without consent uh, and would cover any uh, conduct in connection with the removal of an organ without consent. And I quote here verbatim from the legal advisory, this broad wording of the provision leaves scope for transplantation physicians, nurses, and associated medical staff who train or otherwise interact with overseas medical professionals suspected of forced organ removal to commit an offense uh, where they know that the organ was removed without consent or are reckless to the risk that it may have been removed without consent. Uh, so uh, in addition to this, uh, the bill also strengthens the Immigration and Refugee Act by rendering a person inadmissible to Canada uh, if they are found to have participated in activity related to organ trafficking. So now in its third uh, iteration, uh, in uh, the second reading um, uh, at, um, uh, in the House of Commons, uh, the CMA issued a statement uh, to uh, essentially uh, express uh, that uh, the CMA is uh, deeply disturbed by ongoing effort reports uh, of organ trafficking targeting, targeting uh, minority populations in China, refers to both the China Tribunal and the Uyghur Tribunal. Uh, that has presented compelling evidence. And we felt that it was important to actually call it out and make it real by identifying uh, the uh, nature of the problem. Uh, the um, statement goes on to say that the CMA strongly commends uh, these, uh, these actions and then goes on to say that the CMA strongly supports this bill and urges all members of parliament to pass this important legislation before the end of the, of the session. Uh, we have also, uh, as part of our advocacy efforts, sent letters to all members of parliament uh, saying uh, that the National Medical Association supports this bill uh, and firmly believes that informed consent, to your point, Julian, is a fundamental requirement for organ or tissue donation, which must be obtained before organs are taken. And you would think uh, that uh, today we don't need to say this, uh, but uh, clearly we do. Uh, informed consent, as Julian said, is a foundational pillar of modern medicine uh, and medical decision making. Uh, so with that, uh, we have um, had several opportunities for advocacy uh, uh, and have said that while the CMA supports current criminal code uh, legislation that criminalizes the coercion of organ donation, uh, we have advocated to say that that's not enough. Uh, and that uh, we support the proposed amendments to the criminal code and to the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. And I'm going to um, uh, end here by uh, pointing to two documents that essentially ground uh, this advocacy work. Uh, I generally would have started with our policy, but I wanted to finish with it because uh, to us, this is really the foundation in which we anchor this work. Uh, first is the uh, CMA a policy on organ and tissue donation and transplantation. Uh, and uh, as part of our revision of this policy, uh, we consulted broadly 
And uh, as, as part of this consultation, uh, we um, uh, have uh, spoke with, uh, uh, met with uh, uh, the coalition of organizations that, that you're familiar with, the Doctors Against uh, Forced Organ Harvesting, uh, Canadians in uh, support of refugees in dire need, and the Human Rights Research and Education Center, uh, and uh, the International Coalition to End uh, Transplant Abuse in China. They challenged the CMA uh, to take on the issue of forced organ harvesting uh, to their credit. Uh, and the initiative uh, initially was uh, uh, quickly supported by uh, 500, uh, over 500 Canadian physicians uh, and by a few prominent individuals, including the former uh, Minister uh, of Justice in Canada, uh, Erwin Kotler, uh, whom you may know uh, is an international rights uh, lawyer. Uh, and as a result, uh, uh, the, uh, this policy clearly states that the CMA discourages Canadians from participating in organ tourism as a recipient or donor. Uh, physicians should not take part in transplantation procedures where it is reasonable to suspect that organs have been obtained without the donor's informed consent. And I know that this is a policy and many people question whether that's sufficient, uh, but I can tell you uh, that uh, as the National Medical Association, many people will point to uh, uh, the uh, CMA policy to anchor uh, their um, their activities and initiatives. And so it does have some gravitas, so to speak. And I'm going to end here by bringing it back to uh, the code of ethics, the CMA code of ethics and professionalism, which uh, is are essentially the professions of code of ethics in, in Canada, the, the, the medical profession in Canada's code of ethics. It articulates the ethical and professional commitments and responsibilities of the medical profession. It uh, provides standards of ethical practice to guide physicians and the profession. And it's, it's founded on and affirms the core values and commitments of the profession and outlines responsibilities related to contemporary medical practice. As part of the core values and commitments, I do want to point your attention uh, to uh, uh, the uh, section B, fundamental commitments of the medical profession. The first one, commitment to the well-being of the patient, uh, that physicians must first consider the well-being of the patient, always act to benefit the patient and promote the good of the patient. Uh, one would argue uh, that that would be sufficient in guiding physicians to never uh, participate in uh, what all of us consider to be morally abhorrent uh, practices, uh, 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 profoundly rights violating practices. Uh, but we felt that that was not enough and uh, consistent with the code of ethics from the European Council of Medical Orders. Uh, we added a responsibility uh, to never participate in or condone the practice of torture or any form of cruel, inhumane or degrading procedure. And I recognize that that does not specifically call out a forced organ harvesting, uh, but uh, it does um, articulate uh, the overarching obligation here, uh, which uh, again is part of uh, the obligations of physicians in, in Canada. And that, that really is our foundation in which we anchor uh, our work on uh, uh, human rights violations and uh, uh, broadly and specifically on uh, forced organ harvesting. I'll stop here. Thank you. And I have to figure out how to stop sharing my screen and I will. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Sophie, for sharing your views and outlining the uh, legislative developments and challenges in Canada to address organ trafficking, transplant tourism and forced organ harvesting, as well as the CMA stance on these issues. Uh, very grateful for your time. I think um, perhaps we'll use the last 25 minutes of, of this session just to answer some of those questions that are coming in from the different members of the audience. Um, and one in particular, um, I want to start with, um, someone uh, asked, what are the next steps and who, what entity take, should be taking action to correct this grievous crime? Uh, China denies everything and Lithuania is one of the few countries to take firm action. And I think that who um, is a really important question that I would like to uh, ask our panelists to comment on. Um, perhaps talking about uh, medical associations, uh, transplant societies, 
governments, regulators, and, and who should play the key role in rallying a, a profession that, um, according to the, the comments of all the panelists, uh, there is a low awareness of these issues. So, um, Julian, I see your hand is up. Uh, perhaps you can start us off. It seems to me beyond question um, that we need a, an independent review, that um, the only possibility, I think, of of identifying um, precisely what is going on is for uh, an organization like the United Nations to commission an entirely independent review um, of what is taking place, uh, an investigation into what is taking place. And until such time as there is, as Martin has talked about, complete transparency about what is taking place throughout the organ transplantation system in um, China. These questions will, will endure. Um, and it seems to me that we have got to look for a, a body of the stature and the, and the global reach of the United Nations. But in my view, it would need to be independent of the World Health Organization because both the UN directly and the WHO, as we know, are organizations that are vulnerable to political machination. So in my view, we must look, look towards, um, and certainly the BMA has called for uh, a, a such an independent review or investigation. I think we have to go there somehow. Many thanks, Julian. I wonder, Martin, whether you want to add anything to that, um, particularly on the uh, transparency point, which I know that you raised in your comments earlier. Uh, thank you. I think that the important thing in the context of transplantation, I'll, I'll limit it to that just for the moment, because there's some wider issues as well. The first is that for a successful and effective transplant programme to exist, in other words, to know where a donor is and where a recipient is, a lot of information must have been collected and presumably stored. So uh, any organization that um, wants to go in and look and see what is really happening is going to have to play with that paper trail all the way back to source. And um, I think everyone who's tried to get to grips with the, that paper trail in China has struggled enormously. And it's often held secretly um, as a state secret, it's often um, distorted in some ways, and the publications that they have made about their data are fundamentally wrong. So uh, I don't think it's going to be quite as easy for that group of people going in there to untangle all this unless they have access to all the data, which they can then cross match with individual patient notes. Imagine that. Um, with the, the added value, added difficulties of, of, of doing it in different culture and different language. I think that's going to be a real challenge. The, the other point uh, is that um, many of the investigations which have um, been carried out have already begun to identify key individuals. And I think you would, I would have to hand back to the lawyers in the panel about whether individuals can be named maybe under Magnitsky regulations and dealt with. Now, I certainly don't know enough about that, but I, I would like an independent inquiry to dig through this. I just think it's going to be really, really hard, A, to find a panel and B, to get permissions and then B, to be able to do the work, C, to do the work. A, a B and B is not so good. <laughs> B and C, C to do the work. Um, I, I, maybe I'm just being a bit pessimistic about that, but uh, somebody ought to be brought to book, but how you do it is, a, is more one for Wayne and you, Laura, I think, than for me. Well, I will pass it to Wayne. Um, Wayne, do you have any uh, comments on that? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm also, I think, sceptical of um, uh, an international inquiry. Um, I think with China's position on uh, as a permanent member of the, um, of the Security Council, with um, its long reach, um, on top of that, I think international inquiries take a very long time, uh, and uh, there's a certain cumbersome uh, character to them, which, um, in circumstances like this, can neutralize their effectiveness. Um, to, to my mind, uh, and I see this in international criminal law, 
um, and human rights generally, uh, when we're looking at uh, the possibility of um, international action or more local action, then often more local action is um, uh, more de desirable and in the longer term more effective. And so um, taking this back to the advisory report and the policy guidance, so I think um, national states have to start insisting upon this kind of uh, due diligence. Um, and I think that um, absent it, that type of due diligence involves demanding from, and it's not just China, but um, uh, countries which uh, have uh, unethical transplantation systems, it, it um, would require those countries to answer serious questions and to be more transparent. And I think that's the key, is uh, pressure to encourage transparency from uh, users and beneficiaries and industry insiders. Um, it's a slow but steady and incremental um, pressure, but I think one that um, will get there in the end. Um, and that may sound a bit idealistic or it may sound the opposite of idealistic or too too cynical um, and too um, slow and too uh, ineffectual but i uh, see that as um, in a sense the way that human rights uh, outcomes improve uh, by local action demanding change and demanding for example that simple things like the UN guiding principles, how often are they even mentioned within the transplant industry? I suspect uh, rarely ever. Uh, so there's a huge room for improvement uh, just to encourage um, and pressure uh, industry insiders and organizations within the industry to apply the relevant law. Um, and I think that um, would have significant um, uh, would, would, would lead to significant improvement. I think there's, there's more hope there, I think, than demanding outright that China cooperates with an international inquiry. And, and uh, Martin, I'll pass the floor to you in a second, but just to follow on from that, Wayne, we've had a question in whilst you were speaking. Um, do the panelists think that strategic litigation could form part of the armory of um, battling uh, these human rights violations, uh, for example, against uh, pharmaceutical companies? Well, I, I, I as a lawyer um, who uh, works um, looking for opportunities to strategically litigate, I think um, that may well be um, one of the most effective ways to bring about change. If you look at um, enforcement in relation to uh, businesses, um, or rather if you look at the way that businesses uh, routinely, and I don't just mean the transplant industry, I mean across the board, business routinely ignore their international obligations to respect human rights. Um, and they'll continue to do so without um, enforcement. And I think we've seen a massive improvement or a, a, a significant improvement in business adherence to human rights obligations since uh, there's been a few um, high profile cases against companies. And I mentioned some of them in my presentation. They haven't even led to necessarily to, or many of them, the recent ones over the last few years haven't led to final disposition or final judgments or even adverse judgments, but um, every single one of them acts as a um, real incentive to businesses who then begin to get worried that they're going to be next with all the consequences that flow from that. So the simple answer is I would say strategic litigation may well be the, 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 the stick to beat some of the companies with um, and, to, for, and uh, to force change. If I, if I can just come in there briefly, Laura, it was the, I, I'm, I think I would agree with that as well. And the, but what the GRC is doing with this document too is to put some obligation on all of us who come into contact with these organisations to have a high index of suspicion, which is quite an important thing. The, the, the comment also about who has influence over these organisations, certainly corporate ones, I don't think we should underestimate the change that's happened in, uh, in the investment community through ESG type of investments, environment, sustainability and governance. 
um, there's been, been big changes in the way boards are held to account by the in by outside investors, and I think um, groups like this could put a significant amount of pressure on those investors by exposing them to this information and forcing those boards to act according to your regulations. Uh, the the tr members of the tribunal chose not to campaign because we felt the judgment should stand on its own, and I think that's quite important here that others with your skills have to take this up and take this on because it's not something that, that as individuals you can do. Many thanks. Um, we've had a, a question in um, regarding Julian, your mention of the uh, Geneva Declaration. Um, the audience member asks in relation to the WMA's resolution on academic boycotts and sanctions, uh, forbidding sanctioning of individual doctors uh, for their country's political or social policies. Um, what does the panel feel about the ethics of this, um, particularly with transplantation medicine or um, birth prevention, um, as was uh, detailed in the Uyghur uh, tribunal? Um, this, this sort of activity requires systemic involvement of specialists in planning and implementation in contravention of the Geneva's declaration provision not to use my medical knowledge to violate human rights and civil liberties. Um, I know that's a long one. Does anyone have any uh, thoughts to uh, start us off? Julian? Um, just, I, I, I mean, I, I would be opposed to, I think, the ordinary censure of of, of doctors, individual doctors um, in, in the PRC. I, I think I, I'm not an expert by any means on the PRC, but those who I've spoken to suggest that there simply isn't the scope of liberties that we would ordinarily expect. So I am, I, I'm, I would be reticent to, to move in that direction. But I think, I, I think, 20 years ago, I went to, I was, I went to a meeting in Brussels about, um, about China. And and we were talked we, we, we were we were invited before we went into this meeting to um, not put not foreground Chinese human rights abuses but to be cooperative to be collegiate to engage constructively and twenty years later we are in a position where um, we have proof beyond reasonable doubt that the medical profession in China is engaged in um, genocidal activities. I think the collegiate approach has had its day and it is time that we took strong action, but I would personally um, be wary about, about engaging with individual doctors, but I think the profession as a whole, the medical profession has, as a whole has an obligation to engage with this issue in China. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm, I'm agnostic as to whether individual specialties is the way forward. I simply don't know enough about what's going on in China and the structures of, of medicine in China. Um, but I think collegiality and engagement may have run its course. Thank you. Is that an, yes, absolutely. Thank you. I, I, um, I'll answer the question uh, differently. Uh, I think that uh, one could think of this uh, as um, a question of um, the, the same considerations that are raised by dual loyalty. Uh, in this case, it's not necessarily a question of dual loyalty, but dual obligations. Uh, I, I think it's important to consider that physicians in China uh, probably are, are themselves coerced uh, into uh, doing this. And so, you know, how much can we actually uh, achieve uh, uh, of what, you know, what's happening in, in China is um, really uh, in question. Uh, and, and that's the case for any uh, human rights violations uh, internationally. But I do think that there's, um, there are things that we can do in our own countries and Western countries and encouraging uh, uh, and perhaps even um, uh, mandating uh, for physicians to not uh, be uh, complicit, not participate uh, or even be complicit uh, and that I, I think can have some impact, uh, but I really think that that's where we could affect the most change. Uh, and as the National Medical Association, uh, I think that that's really um, what would be within our scope. Uh, um, and uh, you know, once you start re 
uh, not uh, participating or being complicit in these activities, it can affect some change. Clearly, it's not going to stop the practice, but I, I think it could certainly uh, um, re reduce the scope of the practice because right now uh, we truly are complicit without knowing it. Uh, so, uh, uh, um, you know, in addition to we need to go farther than raising awareness, we need to start encouraging, like I said, perhaps even mandating. Um, but I, 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 at least from, from uh, the perspective of uh, the National Medical Association uh, here, uh, you know, that, that is what we can do. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, how much change we could affect in, in China, given that, uh, you know, there's very little that can be done um, on so many uh, issues in, in, in China, truly, uh, you know, if we're actually honest with each other. So I, anyway, just to say, to turn this around and look at what can we do um, uh, that, that could be effective. And I think there are a number of very tangible things that can be done that could affect change. I'll stop here, thank you. Yeah, and, and may I just jump in? And, and that, in a sense, and I um, completely agree with Cecile. I think, um, uh, and um, you know, I, I, I think that's what we're trying to say, in a sense, in the in the um, in the policy guidance. That the starting point is to look at what we can do in terms of um, our own engagement with dubious um, transplant um, industry. Um, countries practices and so on that's that's got to be the starting point it's it seems to me sort of um leaping over all the action we can take to clean up our own house um and immediately going to sanction individual doctors or individuals within the um chinese uh, transplant industry and we as i i, I don't think anyone uh, from this vantage point can look at those individuals and say they um, are autonomous, independent actors who choose willingly to engage in those activities. Some will and some may not. I mean, this is the reality of um, an authoritarian country. But what we can say for sure is that we have plenty of scope within the transplant industry to conduct due diligence and determine whether um, we continue, I say we, I'm not in the transplant industry, but um, the transplant industry engages with the, um, the research industry, re research house or uh, surgeons or academic journals and determine how to engage with them um, and whether to continue engaging with them if they fear that there are human rights risks. Absolutely, and I, I think that's a, a, a nice segue and um, to, to you, uh, just to talk about um, your kind of call to action for the for the research um, publications. Uh, you talked about the fact that many of them have uh, didn't even retract articles. And what would be your recommendations for um, other research papers that perhaps didn't take as strong a stance um, as uh, Plus One did at the time of the um, independent assessment of those articles? Well, first of all, it's never too late. Um, journals can still act, um, and they should act, in my view, um, given that the evidence is only increasing in, on, on these particular concerns, um, and, and should take a view as whether there's any documentation from authors um, that would support an ethical <laughs> transplant, where there's mounting evidence that this was just fundamentally not the case. Um, so journals need to act on that. And the second thing, what we did at least at plus one is on, on the back of that, um, we committed that uh, if you have, if you publish a study on transplantation, you need to put into the study as well as part of the methods, if you like, or, or your description of what you do. Where do the organs come from? Um, are they, you know, are ethical standards followed? Uh, what are the considerations um, from the donors and so on? So that needs to be in the study. And then also um, the editors, the manuscript editors that handle these kind of these submissions, they also had the liberty to ask for actual documentation. And that's on any, for any country where they had any concern. It's not just to, to not just to identify particular countries or so, but just generally speaking, there needs to be, uh, needs to be a stronger 
vetting, if you like, of, of the international ethics standards. And that's journals still need to do and, and can implement now for anything that's submitted so that it doesn't even get published um, if there are concerns. So that would be the second step. So first of all, looking back at the literature and retract, which may, basically retracting means you you declare that as a journal, you cannot stand behind a study anymore. Um, and the second thing is to do the appropriate vetting on, on any new submissions that come in to ensure that uh, that these international ethics standards uh, and human rights are followed. Thank you. And um, may I ask the other panels, uh, uh, panelists, um, sorry, to uh, wrap up with, from their perspective, um, what would be their call to action um, for those stakeholders that they interact with, um, including uh, transplant associated entities and societies um, and professionals? Um, Martin, perhaps we can start with you. And who should lead this call? Thank you. Um, well, I'll start with the first part of the question. I, I think that all the organisations who uh, are managing um, medics, if you like, so that's the professional bodies, in the case of the UK, the Royal Colleges, the MA itself, grant giving bodies and licensing authorities each have a major responsibility. Um, and individual hospitals, if they're setting up relationships with other hospitals have to do it as well. So one of the good bits about this, the work that you've done is to um, provide that framework. So I'm very much in favor of that. The second thing is I mentioned the high index of suspicion, um, China, uh, still has hundreds of thousands of people in camps. These people are at risk of medical experimentation at the very um, best and other harms at worst, perhaps. So it would be crazy of us to go forward into the next decade without a much higher index of suspicion than we've had in the last decade. And finally, um, to push the point about transparency, I think any... Uh, uh, I, I have a little bit of optimism which I'd like to throw in, which is what the NIH have done in the United States, which is to state in terms that every um, body who gets money from them to do research has to publish or store, and make accessible every single piece of data associated with the experiment, positive or negative. That is the best thing to happen to science for a very, very long time. And I, I would hope that everybody around the world will do the same thing and the countries which don't will find themselves excluded from publication simply because they're not doing that. Uh, I think that will make a big difference. Uh, on a personal level, worry who you're talking to. So, see if I ask you for your concluding remarks um, and a call to action. As I said, and I think as we're all saying, uh, this is um, so, morally abhorrent and we know enough about this now. Uh, there is uh, compelling evidence uh, that uh, there is a systematic uh, industry on forced organ harvesting. And as Wayne said, uh, there's no reason to wait for a smoking gun. In many ways, there is already a smoking gun and we uh, need to act uh, both by uh, raising awareness and actually taking uh, steps uh, that we know will uh, uh, affect change, uh, even if it doesn't uh, completely stop the practice if we want to be honest with each other. Uh, but we can certainly uh, curtail it in a very significant way. And uh, I congratulate all of you for uh, your leadership in, in, uh, in working on this. And, bringing this to, uh, to everyone's attention. Particularly want to congratulate the BMA's leadership on this issue. It uh, really has been exemplary. Thank you. And Julian. Gosh, thank you, Cecile. Uh, I noticed also my colleague, uh, Dr. John Chisholm is in the audience and he's the former chair of the Medical Ethics, BMA's Medical Ethics Committee and currently deputy chair of the Medical Ethics Committee. And he has been an extraordinary driving force in this. Um, and, and his actions, um, particularly his actions um, in bringing these issues to the World Medical Association have been extraordinarily effective. Um, and I'd like to commend him on that. 
Um, I agree with everything that Wayne has been saying about the possibilities of actions related to compliance throughout, if you like, the industry of transplantation. But from my perspective, with my BMA hat on, this is a matter for global medical professional leadership also. The profession has to call this out. Somebody said in one of the chat bars that China is sensitive to global public opinion. And I think that is true. And I think it behooves the medical, it, you know, it, it, it's a fundamental moral obligation of the global medical profession to continue to call this out because it is such an obscene inversion of fundamental uh, uh, moral obligations in medicine. Um, there's, it's, China is enormously powerful. These industries are global. There are gonna be all kinds of opportunities to influence, but the profession also has to take a leading role in calling this out. We have to find a way to ensure that medical professionals do not engage in these kinds of activities. Thank you. And lastly, I'll hand to you, Wayne, for uh, closing remarks. Um, I'm not sure I could uh, uh, better what's been said, um, but we do know enough. Transparency is key. Um, calling it out is key. Due diligence, as we discuss in the policy guidance, is key. So read um, and adopt our proposals. Um, and I um, am confident that if enough um, organizations, if enough of the industry adopted uh, that kind of due diligence, improvements will uh, follow. Uh, bad actors in the, any industry react uh, when their bottom line is threatened by customers, by beneficiaries, by those who engage. Um, and so it's in the hands of those who um, regulate and work within the industry to force change. And it starts with their own due diligence. Well, many thanks to all the panelists um, for their insights today. Um, it's clear that there is a legal and moral, moral responsibility uh, to conduct due diligence, to identify and assess those human rights risks, and that those responsibilities fall on the medical community. Um, I want to thank all the attendees as well today for their great questions and urge anyone uh, with follow up questions to get in touch with Global Rights Compliance. We are a friendly bunch and um, we're always happy to answer your questions. Um, equally, I would like to thank all of our panellists again, uh, Wayne Jordash, uh, Professor Martin Elliott, Dr. Julian Sheeder, Dr. Cecile Bensimon and Dr. Jörg Heber for making the time to take part in today's launch event. Um, and with that, I close the session. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>